Hey everyone, thanks for watching Test 2 Plus. I'm Trace. This is a podcast style show where we take one topic and we break it into five episodes so we can just get really into it. And this week we're talking about the history of science. What is science? When did it first become a thing? And, you know, what is it given and taken away from us? But first we have to ask, where did science come from? What was the first science? The thing is, nobody really knows when science started. I mean, we celebrate lots of people who are considered fathers of science or early scientists like Socrates, Galileo, Newton, Darwin, Curie. There have been people doing science for a long time. I mean, there are generations of anonymous thinkers, people who just thought about the world around them and tried to make sense of it, and they happened for as far as there's been humanity. And it's not just Europeans or Americans, which is who you hear about a lot. There are ancient people who noticed that the sun rose in the east and it set in the west, and they tried to figure out why and how that happened. So before the scientific method, like before the European Renaissance, there was the Islamic world. And the Islamic world was totally down with critical thinking and observation. From the 9th to the 12th centuries, we started to see things like citations and peer review and validity processes come up in Islamic scholars. And it was important because citations tell you where you got that information. Peer review is a way to make sure that you're in line with what everybody else is finding. And validity processes are ways to make sure that what you're thinking about is literally valid. Greeks, too, uh, were talking about this. The Islamic scholars were a little bigger than the Europeans at the time, but the Greeks were following the Socratic method, which is an older way of thinking. It's, it's based in Socrates, and it, the idea was you would make an argument and then a hypothesis, and then you would think about what that meant. You wouldn't actually run an experiment. You would just follow logical processes, and then that would bring you to a conclusion, and that conclusion was then important because you thought about it. But again, no experimentation. So over in Iraq, at the end of the 10th and early 11th century maybe, was this guy named Al-Hassan, also known as Ibn al-Haytham. And I might have screwed up that name, I apologize, so don't speak Arabic. But uh, this person, this guy, might be considered by some to be the very first actual scientist. Uh, Al-Haytham invented the pinhole camera, uh, talked about the laws of refraction. He was a studier of optics, looked at rainbows, eclipses, and started, in fact, looking at telescopy or t using making telescopes. It was the first time that they started breaking down what a telescope physics could be. And he wrote a book that laid down a, a number of scientific practices that became the experimental scientific method. Now, what I remember from the scientific method in seventh grade was you ask a question, you form a hypothesis, you experiment, and you continue going through these things until you get an answer. So as time marched on, a Renaissance scientist named Roger Bacon, who is alive in the 13th century, came on the scene. And this man is credited for solidifying a true scientific method. He's the guy that you see in the picture books and in the libraries and in statues, if they built statues to scientists. I don't really know if they do. But uh, this guy rejected hearsay claims, so the idea that anecdotal evidence was valuable. It's not valuable under the scientific method. We don't want anecdotal experiences. We want provable experiences. He pushed the idea of confirming those experiences, being able to do it again and again. And he pushed really hard for the value of objective observation. Being objective is super hard. Being subjective, or essentially looking at things from your point of view, easy. Everybody does it. We do it constantly. Objective observation is the idea that you're trying your best, and it's basically impossible. You're, you're trying to take yourself out of that situation, to look at it from a differing point of view, to try and make sure that what you're looking at and what you're experimenting is as objective as possible. So Galileo was influenced by a guy named William Gilbert. William Gilbert, you've probably not heard of. He was born in 1544. He attended Cambridge in England, and he published studies on magnetism. It was the first major physical science paper ever published in England, was one of his papers. And he influenced the great thinker that we all know, Galileo. 
Gilbert described the need for, quote, sure experiments and demonstrated arguments instead of, quote, conjectures and the opinions of philosophical speculators. This is another guy that was like, look, that Socratic method is fine, but the scientific method is so much better, so much more accurate. Gilbert would explain his experiments in so much detail that it was kind of incredible. But it was helpful because it helped anyone recreate that experiment. Because if you can repeat an experiment, and you can say, this is the result, this is my method, this was my question. And you say, okay, the question's valid, the method is valid, and the result is valid, but what if you just got that one time? If you don't document it, and they can't do it again and again, you can't really prove that that's the case. That's the answer to your question. So if you document it well, like this guy did, you can repeat the experiment. And that's still used today in science. Good science is good documentation. It's a quote from Avatar, but it's valuable. Because of this, because of this guy, Gilbert, Galileo is described by both Stephen Hawking and you know, Albert Einstein as this birth of modern science, beginning with Galileo. But Galileo is all like, no, dude, William Gilbert, he's the man. He's the founder of the scientific method. Pretty awesome. I say this now today, but of course, this was influenced hundreds of years ago during the Scientific Revolution, which happened from the 1550s to about the 1700s and started with Nicholas Copernicus. He was a scientist that was uh, one of the first people to say that the sun was at the center of the universe. And Isaac Newton, who was also alive at that time, talked about gravity, invented calculus, so on and so forth. These important thinkers. Funnily enough, even though we call this the Scientific Revolution, the term scientist was only coined in like 1834 by a guy named William Whewell. I don't know how to say his name, but it's funny. But before that, it was, it was mathematicians and philosophers and thinkers and these educated men and women who were trying to learn more about the world around them. And that's how science got its start. There were gentlemen scientists during the Victorian period, and now today we have professional scientists, people whose whole job it is is to think about the world in a kind of weird way, and it's amazing. Uh, Isaac Newton said, if I see further, it is only because I stand upon the shoulders of giants, which is pretty awesome when you think about the history of science, because it's just one person after another after another learning things and teaching it to other people. When did you guys develop your love of science? Let me know down in the comments, and also make sure you subscribe so you get all of our Test Tube Plus episodes, and if you haven't seen last week's Make sure you check that out by clicking here. Tomorrow you can come back and find out exactly what science is, because this is the history of thinking. We're talking about what is science? What is it tomorrow? And if you can't wait until then, again, check out last week's episodes. They're pretty awesome. They're about viruses. It's sick. Literally, no pun intended. Okay, bye. Thanks for watching.